Welcome to Books Boys, live from the Grand Library, the Dean and PJ. Guys, keep calm and read your tickets. Uh, PJ, we're using the Anna Karenina method here. He's PJ. Hello there. I'm the Dean, and we are the Books Boys. The one and only. This is the Books Boys show. Get it? Buy it? Books. No Books. Two Ooh. important things to note. PJ is doing his laundry. <laughs> I am doing my laundry because, I'll tell you why, because why not do a bit of laundry while you're doing a nice radio show or listening to the radio show? Because I, I'm just going to show this exclusive content. You have to pay a lot on Patreon to watch this, but there is my laundry pile, Dean. Oh wow, it's, PJ, uh, you're gonna you're gonna get me too excited now. You gotta be careful with that pile. Well, I'm just saying, it's if you want if you want to pay for that kind of content, uh, lads and lassies. Do I do uh, I have to pay mucho, to see this? Mucho dinero, mucho dinero. Well, I mean, we can talk about that check afterwards that you're going to send me over. Just saying, <laughs> exclusive content, everyone. And the second thing we should note is we are currently lacking um, Alfred. He's he's taken uh, he's taken some time off. For it's it's springtime. We just had St. Patrick's Day. We're coming up towards Easter. He's just taken a little extended vacation. Um, well, after that contribution he did last month, which was basically saying not a single word. He must be very exhausted. Yeah, he, he is. And you know, I really hope that the listeners will forgive us. I hope that the show is still enjoyable without him. You know, I know that he he it's does really. He's a vital part, you know. He's vital. That's the that's the key word. Anyway, okay, books, well, you know, just, books. Uh, what's it all about? You know what I mean? Uh, I know we've been asking this a few times. Um, any answers from the any answers from the internet or the internet, as uh, my stepmother mm-hmm. would say? Well, not and, and not on the not on the interwebs, uh, but we got some carrier pigeons, and they all brought um, they brought me some paper, and but I was confused. I thought that the paper was mm-hmm. the book. Uh, but it turned yeah, out yeah. it was just a little scrap of parchment with with some scribbles on it, so it wasn't very uh, helpful. Well, uh, unrelated, actually. Perhaps you, perhaps all these um, uh, all these plays and poems, they can be found in bottles in the middle of the ocean. I heard they put um, stories into them, right, or letters. I, I heard a sentence. song about about a message in a bottle. Um, right, but okay. how much well, paper is, is required for it to be a book? You know, that's that's what we don't know. How many trees? It's a mystery. How many trees? It's a mystery. Uh, shock, isn't it a bit shocking? Now, uh, to be honest, like they say, it's made out of trees, and it is a bit of a strange thought, isn't it? That you are, and not to get macabre here, but it's just just a bit of food for thought. You are re, you are basically holding a tree that's passed away. I mean, have you ever indeed, thought about that? I'm holding four. Thought. So, <laughs> well, it's a strange thought. I'm just saying, like, and for what kind of trees? Yeah, I know it is kind of slightly sobering. And no, I'm just saying, like, we're putting stories in, yeah, on trees. I mean, it's kind of a beautiful thought, too. Mm. Uh, which is, makes me happy because uh, I'm going to mention the book in a second. But one of the books I, I read actually talks a bit about that. He you know, purposely um, found an association where, where his books are basically printed on, what's it called? Basically, not organic trees, but... Uh, forests that are controlled that that they're sorry I'm not saying this right controlled forests where they're regrown almost immediately so sustainable forests that's the word so he does print his books on sustainable paper ah good good yeah, yeah. was it's not, not something people think about right they just think about recycling so i mean it's just something to think about guys think about the trees outside when you're when you're reading that book as well how can you help the trees Anyway, that's just a little food for thought. Oh, PJ, yeah. before we get into our books, what's the oh. what's the news with you? Uh, well, I've been. Oh, well, I was just I was just saying there to Dean. I have been busy um, since we last talked. Pretty much at the same time I started, just afterwards, started writing a children's book. And um, I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep it a bit of mystery. What's about? But it's about a small animal, although he's usually big. So okay. that's all I'm saying right now, and what the implications are. He's shunned from society because he's not as big as he should be, not as great I know, as I know he should that be, feeling. not strong. Oh, there you go. And also about 
well, the interaction between yes. humans and animals. So I just finished that book at the weekend, actually. So I'm really happy about that. Because it's been a while since I did some, some writing. Yeah. Know? Congratulations, uh, good sir. Oh, well, cheers. Thanks. I mean, all that, all that, that's why I was reading a lot of children books, not to, not to get the ideas, but just to get into the vibe of like how to write more kind of concise writing, a lesson down. I'm really interested mm-hmm. at the moment at editing down. So your children's like, books do not follow the Anna Karenina method. Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm afraid I'm going a bit, a bit against our Anna Karenina method. So I'm very sorry, Mr. Tolstoy, but, um, I'm just, I'm more interested in what is, <laughs> what is the story of Anna Karenina? Can I read Anna Karenina in two pages? This is what I, I'd be interested. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what have I been doing? Um, I've been to London. I went with, with Playboy Alex and Dark Place Robert. We went to London. We went to Shakespeare's Globe Theatre and we saw nice. Titus Andronicus um, performed. It was oh. absolutely fantastic. It was an all-female cast. Um, they added some songs in, they added some jokes in, but they still kept the original script perfectly. Although, uh, what's, hold on a second, I thought I haven't read it, but I thought it was supposed to be one of the most violent plays. It's I've very violent. Jokes, like that in so the order. they didn't add jokes, they just they made a few of the lines that were already just there kind of in a funny yeah. way, just sure. to give you a little break from the mass murders that you're seeing, essentially. <laughs> right, um, yeah, yeah. But they did it perfectly. But, if anything, I think it was an improvement. Wow. Um, wow, and I reread okay. the play, and then we did a quick bonus episode of Playboys where we talked about the show we went to see. So that's on our on our Patreon oh, that's, as well. That's pretty sweet, yeah. It's great that you had the experience, and I believe it's our mutual friend Alex's favorite Shakespeare play, or one of his favorite Shakespeare plays, is it? It's up there, and I think it, it went even higher after watching the, this performance. And what a great uh, treat, anyway. Mm. And what else have I done? I, I've been working on my, my Mexican dance and I performed in the Europa Hotel in uh, Belfast for the Culture Shock uh, night. That's pretty and cool. I, I did a, a Veracruz, a polka and a mambo. So that was that was fun. So so we can, we can see. I mean, we basically pay money to see a dance now. That's that's the new thing. So if you want to see one one book boy dance that's um, it, yeah. in, in Belfast. And wow, then I was really also good. in a in a St. Patrick's parade in Newry, so I've been busy. Oh, I heard about that, yeah. And I heard that they had oh, one of our favorite Potter's Head songs. <laughs> yes, we went, we went afterwards <laughs> to, a, to a bar and they had uh, My Lovely Horse, which I think we've, we've played our oh, version of on the show before. And we've Alex done it a few times. Not not amused, but uh... <laughs> a bit a bit of uh, a bit of backstory. I think we mentioned this back when it happened, but last year, February, uh, when I was in uh, County Clare, our mutual friend Alex and Dean here came to visit. Me and Elisa, we we talked the story before. We're just telling it again. I think so. And and but I got I got used I got to the habit of bringing a guitar and the rented car we had. I wasn't driving a tank car. I was just playing by the side. And for some reason, why did we even start with? My you weren't you weren't playing guitar. and driving. Let's got yeah, let's yes. I would, that would be a bit too uh, yeah. <laughs> that would be a bit too too much in the literature uh, scene. But I don't know why we start playing that song. But as soon as we started, we pretty much didn't stop playing for the whole time you were there. Yeah. And our mutual friend Alex um, is, you know, Americano, and he, I suppose he doesn't have the father Ted, um, you know, <laughs> essence in him. He didn't appreciate it. I, just I think it he did at first, but I think uh, I think you wore him out. <laughs> well, maybe all right. I suppose <laughs> if you think if you think, well, yeah. yeah. Also, oh. so by the way, you know, uh, performed in a, in a bar. I think we're going way off topic here. I'm just going to mention, I think they have Father Ted Festival right now in March. I heard I that they do that, that. yeah. Because remember I told you last last time, I mean, that was February last year, I also mm. said, you know, in March we should go, and we did it. And they oh, have I it again. Just, it. Someday, someday we'd love to go. Yeah. Anyone wants to give us any free tickets, guys? Yeah. Free. And I should mention, we're actually recording, I haven't read as much as you're used to, because we're recording a week early. Um, and because Alex and I are, are taking a sojourn uh, to Athens. <laughs> um, so we've nice. been reviewing on, on Playboys, on, on patreon.com slash booksboys. We've been reviewing some ancient Greek plays. We're doing some comedies. Um, and we're going to move on to some tragedies from next month. And we just thought, you know, it's time to go to Athens to see see where it's all starting. So See where it's all at, yeah. Why yeah. not? Yeah, go back to your origin. Next would be Rome. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah, I've done Rome before, but I've never been in Athens. I've always wanted to go. Um, That's pretty sweet. But look, I see. This is why we're missing Alfred, and we're we're getting off topic. We're we're round. Yeah, we're just getting off topic. It's just it's just a conversation here, lads. But I suppose the ultimate question: people are dying to find out what are the four books you've read. Uh, I've read a bit myself. Um, you got two there, the right? First... 
I've got two right here, two lovely books. So we've got some nice books. Now, first of all, I can, I'm trying to guess four books. So I'm going to guess you read one Duma that you probably didn't like. Hold on. I'm just going to try to, I really don't know. <laughs> no, I didn't listen to your message. Oh, I sent you the one I read. You didn't listen. No, no, okay. no. Okay. I did it on purpose because I wanted it to be smart. So I'm, I'm really guessing now. So I haven't done much... Duma. I, I do have. So, no, 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 no. Hold on. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Okay, okay, I haven't read. No, hold on a second. Let the listeners guess. So guess now and dial 1780 uh, to get a, a special price. Mm -hmm. A special price if you can get the right answer. Pre what press 1 been? for Dumas, press 2 for Balzac. <laughs> so wait a second. <laughs> I'm going to go with a Dumas sequel that made no sense whatsoever and you couldn't categorize because the translation was so bad of the title. <laughs> That you're not sure in what pentalogy or sextalogy it belongs to. Okay. Now that's hold on, hold on a second. That's believable. My second, my second guess is that you either got you're you're into um a second, hold on a second. We're in, in, talking about Dickens, but we're staying Victorian now. I believe you might have stayed Victorian, something Victorian. Now any guess, guys? Uh, let's go for a Thackeray. Let's go for William Thackeray, not Vanity Fair. You probably read a lesser book. Mm -hmm. this, okay. is, this is my guess okay. second third of all i'm gonna guess that you might have gone spanish at some points knowing you because yeah. you, you have a tendency going spanish you know if you, if you if you sit still for long enough you turn spanish start dancing spanish you've been dancing spanish now yeah so, so maybe a galdos a galdos and the fourth is probably a guilty pleasure because you love your once once a month guilty pleasures this is okay. my guess okay well, oh, yeah. I will. I will do the reveal. Um, I read okay. a Thackeray. Oh, hold on a second, drum roll. You read a Thackeray. <laughs> I read a Thackeray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Henry Brilliant. Esmond, uh, which I'll talk about in in just a few Brilliant. seconds. <laughs> Brilliant. So I got that um, one right. Okay. Yeah. So I, I've been trying to return to old friends. Last month I had a Dumas. Yeah, um, I had the feeling you're and a Wilkie Collins. I've got a Galdos and a Balzac on the shelf, but I'm not going to do them just yet. Oh. I thought I would go to another old friend, uh, Tolstoy. Oh, right. I forgot. So we're just talking about the it. The Cossacks. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. That's one of his earlier novels, isn't it? Yeah. Then I went okay. for uh, an, an old Spanish friend, but one that we spent an entire episode five on. Oh, my God. Um, I read me. some Zafon. Zafon. Nice. El Palacio de la Media Noche. Yeah. Lovely. And then I read a recommendation from Alex that was totally out of the blue. You would never have guessed this. Um, oh, oh, Nathaniel so, Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. Ah, stop it now. Then you've gone all American on me. Have you? I don't think you've ever read. Uh, it's the first uh, time American I think novel. I've read, other than maybe wow. someone that we've chatted to, it's the first time I've read an American classic oh, yeah, yeah. on the show. I mean, American classic. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, let's hear, let's hear about it. So I'm really, let's go then for Thackeray. So what was it, yes. this Thackeray like? <laughs> I mean, people are just known for Vanity Fair. So I, mean, yeah. I also have I mean, no idea about his other stuff. Vanity Fair is a near thousand page sprawling book full of hundred characters. It's very hard to follow, but it's a lot of fun. This is a okay. shorter book, okay? It's only about 450 pages. Um, yeah. I, I want to say that it's less fun and less well-structured, but it's still a good book. So it's called Henry Esmond, yeah. and it's about, obviously, the, the titular character himself, mm -hmm. a Mr. Henry Esmond. Um it starts off very Dickens. So Henry Esmond is an orphan. He's living with like some people who are not uh, very mm. kind to him. And he mentions that the relative he's living with, you know, boxes his ears and uh, you know, is very mean to him. Um, and I thought, oh, we're, we're going like Dickens route. But then almost immediately mm. he says he was taken away from that house by a different relative. And that's the end of the, the Dickens uh, portion of the, of the novel. Okay. Interesting. Did it seem like almost like a parody of Dickens? Because it was almost later, like, right? Yeah, I I read it as almost like I'm going beyond Dickens. You know, like yeah, here, yeah, yeah. here's what's popular. I'm going to cover it in twenty pages, and then we're going to move beyond that. You know, right? Okay. Um. So he moves to another <laughs> relative, and then to another relative. So it's it's very weird. It's a very slow start because he's moving around to these different people's houses. Um, but eventually he settles with a particular family um, mm -hmm. in their kind of manor house. And they've got a son and daughter and they, they look well, quite kind to him. We, we don't go the Dickens route. These people are actually very kind to him and he, he eventually gets on <laughs> very well with them. Okay. 
but he also falls in they they almost adopt him as oh. their kind of son but then he falls in love with his oh. stepsister if oh, you will oh, uh, Beatrice. oh so he's Henry there. We've got um, the Lord and Lady of the house, and we've got Beatrice and little Frank. And he's a kind of older sibling or, or older cousin type character to, to them. Mm. So there's also the backdrop of this. All these books seem to have this political and religious kind of backdrop. There's um, Protestant versus Catholic type things happening. There's revolutions going on, you know, political overthrow, kings being overthrown and, and all this kind of stuff in, in the background mm. of it. And there's a Father Holt and he has a secret entrance to their house where they're just like, he can come and go, but eventually he, the, the house kind of gets raided because uh, they've been holding, you know, clandestine religious and political uh, meetings and, and things like okay. that. I don't really care about that side of it. But um, interestingly, Father Holt disappears for many years, but later we bump into a, a, a royal emissary, a certain Captain Von Holtz, who uh, oh. bears a striking resemblance to, to Father Holt. <laughs> okay, so he sounds like a character. He's fun, um, and he just, he, he just teaches, you know, whatever. But <laughs> I suppose what I, what I really want to say, I'm going to try to keep this brief, because this book suffers from being too short, actually. Vanity oh, Fair. Okay. It's, it's trying to be as sprawling as Vanity Fair, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have half the space, you know? Yeah. And that's the problem. And the first, the first half is quite good. Once we get past the sort of triple start intro of him moving around, he's getting along yeah. with his family. It's all very nice. Um, then he contracts smallpox. Right. So he's a kind fellow. He's in the, in a bar you know, playing with some kids. One of them's got smallpox and he brings it home and infects the house, um, basically. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, Lady Esmond absolutely worships her husband. She worships the ground. He walks on. She thinks that he's just fantastic and amazing. Actually, he's unintelligent and he's a bit of an alcoholic. Okay. Right. Bless um, he says, okay, smallpox is into the house. I'm off. He disappears, goes to a different town and gets a mistress. So what? when he comes back, to find his wife altered by the smallpox and is quite cold to her, she oh. immediately loses all the kind of worship that she's had for him. And right. that, that family is broken for, forever from, from that moment. Interesting. But hold on a second. So the protagonist, what's his name again? Sorry. Henry. Henry, so he brought in the smallpox. So does he start yeah. feeling guilty? I mean, not he that does, and she almost throws him out. The lady right. Esmond, yeah. she, you know, she's you could have killed my children by bringing this in, and she's very, very harsh to him. But she does later recant it, and they do, they do make up. Okay, right, okay, yeah. Um, no, there's a big twist that comes, but it comes quite early, so it's not really a spoiler as such. It's actually integral to understanding the plot. Father Holt okay. reveals that the title of Lord was given to the wrong branch of the family, and he has some documents oh. to say that Henry, far from being the little foundling sort of orphan boy, he's the real Lord Esmond. All oh, right, okay. But he's such a kind okay. chap that he doesn't want to take it away from his sort of stepbrother Frank, who's going to inherit it when his dad dies. And he says, these people have been right, kind right. to me, and I will, never t I will never take the title off them. And he right, suffers a lot of hardships in the book because he is a kind of orphan he's a kind of misplaced uh, person but he just bears them all you know this victorian idea about just bearing yeah. the, the bad luck that you've been given the ill health whatever else and he just bears it stiff upper lips it and and never tells anyone until near the end right okay but you know young frank is always nice to him anyway the only young yeah. frank's quite neutral he makes one or two mistakes because he becomes an adult and goes out and likes the women for a little bit but he reins himself in pretty quickly um, who okay. we don't like is Beatrice. He's in Henry's in love with Beatrice, but she's the ultimate coquette, you know. And she just goes around um, flirting with everyone, and um, she's really not very nice in the end. She's very different from the mother. They always say that the mother is this paragon of virtue, this you know saintly woman. She's just so perfect, and even her daughter says she's too perfect. I could never be like her, so I'm just going to be the opposite almost, you know. Yeah. Henry yeah. says, this woman is terrible for me and she would ruin my life if I married her, but I feel that she is my fate and I should marry her anyway. So this is like Victorian <laughs> ideas, like why, why be happy? Like why, why do something that you think will bring you happiness <laughs> when you could just like give yourself eternal grief, right? Of course, of course, yeah. That's it turns out she will marry him because he's not the Lord and he self-sacrifices 
And he just says he's not going to give her the title. So he goes off to the military to try to gain some honors for himself there. And yeah. he does it all. His whole life's goal is to impress her. And she's not interested. She's going off with other guys. You know, she's not interested in him at all. Right. Okay. Um, because he's too old. And they mention like this guy, you're just too ancient. And I think he's something like 36, you know. And they say, like, well, you know, he's just, he's, he's done for. 36. 36. Right. Well, that's ancient. Yeah. And she's, yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> In fact, sorry, that, that the same thing happens in the next book where the guys are too old and 36. And the girl, I think really? at one point, they actually say that even even Beatrice is an old maid now at 25. The, the other girls in the in the town think that she's beyond marriage now, that she's hit the, the wow. ancient age of 25. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You know what they say? What beyond 25, you know, finally goes dark. Hmm. But what happens is that's ridiculous. I suppose that's a very Victorian. Is he, is he making a point that this is something wrong, Zachary? I mean, I'm not even sure if he good. is, or is it just really a Victorian belief? I think he just was in with it. Yeah, right. Yeah. But per Henry, Sorry. so what happens is I'm going to give one one spoiler because it's an important plot point. After the father dies and Frank inherits, right? That was to be expected. But how does the okay. father die? In a duel. Right, because there's a Dumas friend up. who was flirting with his wife, and he had to protect the family's honor by killing the guy. But the guy kills him. All right, okay. And Henry was a witness, so the wife says to Henry, "You brought smallpox into my house, and you ruined my marriage, and now you've watched my husband die." And she casts him aside, and he goes to jail. Wow, yeah, that's pretty radical. Yeah, so that oh, happens. Wait. I was like, but you're telling, you're telling a lot of the story now. I mean, but still. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop there. The only thing I'll say okay. is it does follow the Anna Karenina method. There's a good 60 or 70 pages of military campaigns. You know, oh, it's like gosh. Henry went off to impress her by doing military campaigns. Let us tell you all about them. <laughs> that oh, no. Many, many military campaigns. The only Unfor- thing interesting about them is that one of them takes place in a raid in Vigo, which is, really? yeah, of course, in Galicia, where I've been many times and where Valerie the Pigeon Detective lives. So it was All nice right, so you actually... go up here, but they plunder it, so that was not nice. <laughs> oh, that wasn't very nice. But did you recognize even some of the streets, even though... No, they don't go into much detail, um, but they just mention that's a pity. That they're in vegan. You know, I think if you're going to follow the Anna Karenina... If you're going... Like, this is what I think, really. I, I was just saying that I prefer, like, the essence of a story at the moment. I like I like minimalist at the moment. But uh, if you're going for the Anna Karenina method, I think there's still some art to it. You know, I still like mm. works like Ulysses, where he goes into great, great geographical detail. Yeah. detail of Dublin. So, I mean, like, if you're going to do it, I think you might as well just, like, do a bit of research if you're going for that route. That's, and, like, that's then fair. I think it's interesting. But I think that's just lazy if you're just going to more or less kind of... Oh, that's a pity. Because mm. that would have made it more enjoyable, I feel like. It would have. It would have, yeah. I would have yeah. liked the Vigo stuff. What's interesting, okay. though, is this is a story about everyone being nice to each other, more or less, you know? The, the husband and wife have their problems, kind of, yeah. but Henry's great. Everyone's nice to him. They see him as this kind old character. Um, the, you know, the mother pays for his education because she says, well, I want to send you off and get, and get a good education and make something of yeah. yourself. He has another old aunt who helps him get into the army. Like, it's not mean people. It's not like Dickens-type uh, people, you know? It, yeah. It's just like, let's all be happy, almost. Uh, yeah, they've got well, their problems. They've got the smallpox. They've got the father dying, but they do what they it's a, can, you know. It's an interesting. I find it interesting because it's something that's not often talked about at that time, which is kind of like pleasing others and the consequences maybe of not of of, of always saying yes, mm. isn't it? I mean, you should be saying more no. So an there are, of course, of- some of the usual sexisms, and they mention, you know. A woman, um, the best thing she can ever do is be asked to pawn her diamonds for her husband. Um, she takes oh, great pleasure in, in having to do that uh, sacrifice for her husband. Um, right. Which, of course, links us into uh, this month's sponsor. It is, of course, the new hit single, Pawning My Diamonds for My Husband, by the band Everyday Normal Women. Um, so you can, <laughs> you can get that on, uh, on the jukebox today. <laughs> That's a great title, actually. Everyday Normal. <laughs> Everyday Normal. Everyday Normal, man. Yeah. Women there. Okay, but that's the they, 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 the, they do the usual thing where they move away from their estate because they're all rich, right? So they go live somewhere else oh, yeah. and the estate's crumbling oh, yeah. and then they go back to it one day and all this kind of stuff, you know. But there's a very important hint, and I, I, I'm going to just hint at it. Um, but okay. the sister always says, I don't think that Henry's the right person for me because he never made enough of himself. But you know who you really would do well with, Henry, is my mum, your adopted mum, essentially. What? 
So that's yeah. I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, I feel and like he worships the mum. So he yeah, wor worships her. Yeah. Let's just see what way he worships her at the end. Okay, mm -hmm, I see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Interesting. It's getting a bit. Uh, yeah. It's getting a bit Miss Robinson esque. I feel like the whole kind of <laughs> Roger esque. Okay. Okay. Some of the sexism oh. is, is bad for me. Like there's a, there's a girl that, uh, Be there's a guy, sorry, a duke that Beatrice is getting together with at one point and they're thinking about marrying him. And, you know, Henry gives her some diamonds and all of a sudden she likes him now. And she thinks, oh, maybe I should have picked Henry because he's given me diamonds. You know, that's 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 how diamonds. fickle she is. And the, the right, husband-to-be okay. is like, you know, no one but but me is allowed to give diamonds to, to my wife, you know? And he takes a great insult and he makes her give them back. Good Lord. So there's that you know, kind of con not, controlling, you know, stuff as well. I'm going to go off topic here, but I'm really enjoying listening to you and uh, just doing the laundry. You know, I, I could, you know, I'm not really much of a laundry kind of uh, fella. But I've got to say, I kind of see the the, the joy <laughs> and just, no, honestly, of like folding laundry, just something very meditative. Just saying mm -hmm. that, guys. So I'm feeling like, uh, you know, not like an everyday woman, feeling like, uh, right now, feeling like, uh, I don't know where this is going right now. I don't feel like a woman. I just feel like a man who's enjoying things. <laughs> I don't laundry. know what's happening. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. But very going off very topic. I want to tell you about the book that I read. Right. And I was just saying to Dean, I was re I was reading these two books after I got a bit ill in the stomach, which in a sense uh, kind of forced me to relax. So it wasn't very enjoyable at the beginning, but then I just had to take some time off work and really just I just wrote a lot in the end and read and finished uh, the book I was working so on. So it was a prolific week. That was just last week. And this book here really relaxed me. It was the kind of children's book I've been looking for, Dean. It's called Das kleine Gespenst, The Little Ghost by Ottfried Preussler. Very Germanic name. Okay. Um, and now Ottfried Preussler, he's not famous in, anymore. Relatively well known in Germany in the 60s. And this little book, um, has been turned into film a few times, but I, uh, it has been translated into English. I highly recommend it. It's a pity that people seem to have forgotten it. Uh, I think people confuse it as Casper. It's got nothing to do with Casper, except that it's a little ghost living in a mm. castle. But it's the kind of book that I was looking for, then because I've been looking for the kind of like Pippi Longstocking kind of book, like this kind of, you know, this kind of Swedish kind of 40s, children's uh, book which is just about essentially about not much about nothing to quote you know it's Seinfeld you know but I'm looking for these kind of children books that are not really about big adventures or, or pirates or whatever well Pippi Longstocking has pirates but I'm saying it feels like she's doing everyday things or even mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. movie troll series and um, they're doing maybe some fantastic things but there's a lot of kind of depictions of them, them walking just in nature and stuff like that or just enjoying the, the nights or just talking about friendship and essentially this is from that era this is from the 60s uh that's kleine gespenst the little ghost follows a that's the name of the look, beautiful illustration look at that mm, nice yeah yeah beautiful illustrations by uh, little called, ghost in a rocking chair yeah i mean and, 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 and in a treasure chest yeah and he's li he lives in a treasure chest and he it starts off with the phrase, ein harmloses kleines Nachtgespenst, a harmless little night spirit. And he lives in Eulenstein um, Castle. Uh, what he does, he just, he's just a little ghost who just wakes up at midnight and roams around the castle for one hour before just falling asleep and lying back in his chest. And okay. he's got a friend. He's got a friend who's an owl. So there he is, not a beautiful illustration. I recommend this. Just oh, that one is very nice. That full page illustration. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna make a, a few photos. It's full of black and white illustrations, but absolutely beautiful. Mm. And this is um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uhu Shuhu, and that's the owl. He's a very wise owl, and he's the little ghost's friend. The little ghost doesn't have a name, and but the little ghost, he's been there for hundreds and hundreds of years in this castle, and he just kind of wants to see the town in daylight so he always roams around at night and he has a big wish and he wants to just wake up one day during the day but he can't he tries often and the secret is only mr Uhu shuhu the owl knows this that the town clock when it strikes at midnight is the moment the little ghost can waken up ah. unless it doesn't strike and it doesn't strike during the day 
it doesn't wake up. But what happens is that one day, the clock strikes at midday instead of midnight. It turns out someone made a slight uh, mistake and tuned the, he tuned the clock again, but instead of doing it at midday, right. he, at midnight, he did midday. It's the same so thing. So the clock he, goes on at midday instead of midnight. So what does that mean? He gets to wake up during the day then for the first time. So, so he wakes up at day, yes. And at first, uh, he's delighted and he sees, he goes outside. But of course, there are people outside and they do see him. He's a visible ghost. And immediately, the second half of the book is just about him getting away. He escapes down an underground tunnel. He gets lost. He only is awake for one hour. He falls asleep like on the dot at one o'clock. Mm-hmm. And he's lost and confused. And basically, he's causing havoc all around the town. They're all terrified of him, even though he just kind of just wants to play as an instant little ghost. Mm. And he's got to find his way back to the castle. He's lost the way back to the castle. And the thing is, he also just wants to become a normal ghost again. He's become also, um, he's become also a, uh, he, he turns also into uh uh, where am I getting at? He he basically turns into a, a sad little ghost that and no one can understand them, and he doesn't have his friend but anymore. PJ, what happens friend. if he falls asleep? You know, after the hour, and he's not gotten back home. After the hour, and he hasn't gone home. Well, he just has to stay where he is. You see, he has to find a chest or somewhere. He usually falls asleep inside of suitcases or chests or drawers or like trunks. So he always tries to find a place. Right. And he doesn't want to get, but nothing can happen to him. He's a ghost. But at the same time, he just wants his peace again. So it's kind of, he just wants to be the normal ghost he was. And it's just about him trying to find his way back to that. And he meets some kids who start to help him. And really, the story is just a lovely, very short, you'd read it in a day, um, hmm. kid stories about a little ghost. And it's just the illustrations I love about it. And he's kind of like, here he's kind of just like crying. Oh. But he just can't get back to his place. Now, the one thing he does have, he does have a set of keys that he holds on to because he explains that if he didn't hold on to them, he would just fly off with the wind. Right. But these keys open up any door or lock that exists. So it's a key point in the story. And, you know, what I like about, and I'm going to talk about the next author, because funny enough, uh, the two authors I'm talking about today used to be teachers, both of them. Right. The both men who used to start, who started off the career as teachers. And I find it interesting because I'm a teacher too. And they've they've got the same story, the next author as well. Just teachers who started telling stories to their kids mm. and eventually thought, yeah, okay, they seem to enjoy this. Maybe I should write stories so that more kids can, can read uh, about my stories. So it's something very honorable. And mm. um, yeah, I just I just love it. If you can find a copy, guys, have a look at The Little Ghost. It's kind of gespenst by Otfried Poisler. There he is. Okay, there we and, go. Uh, beautiful nice. illustration. Now, beautiful illustration. Is this available different. in English? In fact, Dean, you'd be delighted <laughs> to know it says specifically in the 60s edition and what language it was, it was translated already. It must, it must have been really popular because mm. this was even translated into Basque. Oh, wow. In like Basque. So, like, That's and also, Af- now. Uh, also Norwegian and Slovenian. So, and including English, yes. So, guys. Uh, might not be popular anymore that much, but lovely 60s book. Uh, innocent kind of children's stories, story, but still he's a ghost. So it's not that kind of like every day or mundane either. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, good. Well, check it out. Before we hear about your second book, I'm going to do my second book. But before we do Hi. that, I think it's Hi. time to tell everyone to go to patreon.com. Slash book. If you want, because, because on... <laughs> Yeah, because on Patreon.com, you could potentially, for dinero, money, 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 or money, you but not can much get, money. well, not a very lot of more. If you want to pay a bit extra, you can see me doing laundry. Ah, so I'm right. I'm just saying, right. like, I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah. But for a very little amount, you can also see Playboys. Yeah, for like $3 and three pounds, you get Playboys. Um, we've got no, all no, our Shakespeare's. Mean, we've got our... When um, we say Playboys, we mean the theatrical uh, version. We, we an- analyze... Uh, theaters, theater, darling. Now we're releasing the older episodes on our Books Boys feed for free, but why don't you go and get the full back catalog, all of our Shakespeare's, all of our other um, plays, whether it's in Spanish plays, whether it's in other plays from around the world, 
And now, of course, we're doing all the ancient Greek plays um, and all the comedies are already out. So why don't you go and check those out? Plus, you've got Dark Place Dreamers with myself and Robert. We reviewed Garth Marenghi's Dark Place and The Sandman. Mm. Then you've got a few other bits and pieces like Poetry Pals and Film Fellows and uh, interviews from The Vault where I interviewed rock stars and all sorts of things. So go check that out. Nice. You get a T-shirt. Or, you, you know. or even a special episode where you described your um, trip to London, right? Was yeah, yeah. Alex? And of course, speaking of t-shirts, if you go to booksboys.com, you can just buy a t-shirt on there as well. You can get the Anna Karenina Method. You can get Keep Calm and Read Your Dickens. You can get Is this a holiday? Is this a holiday? You can get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> and we never find out if it was a holiday or not. Uh, you know, I think every day is a holiday. Hence home, you I message. creatures. Hence home. <laughs> <laughs> Great play, old JCA. That's it. Well... Oh yeah! So before I do my book, I'm I'm talking about the Patreon. I'm supposed to yeah. supposed to play the <laughs> jingle. To sell it. Yeah, so, oh yeah, yeah. It's a supposed to sell it. thing here. It's cheap though. Get it, guys. The facts that will right. be right. happy. Yes, PJ. Hello there. Now, PJ, what have we learned about Shakespeare? He's a holiday. <laughs> Hello. Dark Place Robert and Playboy Alex. Doing all right. Glad to be here again. So I've given you those nicknames. I'm not a fan of that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where people will know you from. No, that's why you're going to know me from that one. But let's <laughs> carry on. Anyway. Hello, Mother. Can you hear me? Join us for Shakespeare written, Spanish plays and poetry, rock star interviews, film reviews, Dark Place Dreamers, and more. Patreon.com slash Booksboys. Get it? Buy it, books. So, nice. that's that's that. What else have I read? Well, I already I already gave you the breakdown at the beginning, but the next book that I'm going to talk about is the Tolstoy. Um, this is the Cossacks, oh. but but Swerve. I'm not going to spend uh, much time on the Cossacks. And, to be fair, although we mentioned Tolstoy, every episode is the first episode where we actually review the Tolstoy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. the Cossacks. So, this is three books. This is actually three novellas. So the whole the whole thing is only 330 pages, but it's split into three novellas. And The Cossacks okay. is supposed to be the main one. Um, it, it was probably my least favorite of the three. Oh, so I will, I will mention all three briefly, but I'm only really going to talk about one of them, okay? So, I mean, The Cossacks itself, we've got this chap. This, oh, this is set in Russia and everything, uh, all three of these stories. But we've got this one chap. He goes to hang out with the. He's rich, um, and he's an army chap. But he goes to hang out with a bunch of Cossacks, and um, they're living um, in, in huts and things like that. He wants to live a more a more simple lifestyle, and they're sort of they're kind of warriors. Um, but essentially, look, it's just a bit of a. It's a sort of a love story, but the girl he likes is already mm. sort of not unofficially engaged to another. Yeah, chap. I've heard I've heard about the story a bit. Mm. Yeah. And just so, to give a bit of uh, hindsight as well, uh, Tolstoy was young when he wrote this and rich himself. I think he was a was he a count? I'm not quite sure. Mm. And so I think at the beginning of his like career, he is he's already starting to change. He's already seeing like yeah, with this money, it's not really bringing me much. How can I help the people? So he is actually was actually a very generous sort mm. of person who really became very. Kind of, he became very Christian, but in a very, I suppose, in his own uh, philosophical, which you like, yeah, yeah, in his own kind of like after thinking about a lot. Anyway, but I'm just curious uh, if that reflects while you tell the story. But please continue. Well, it does, it does a little bit. Um, it's more about you know forgetting the the wealth never really brings you anything, and yeah, you know, okay, it's a bit more on helping people in in community and uh, and that kind of thing. You know, that that's his big thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. So that's that's the main vibe. But I mean, he likes this one girl. And he's not really going to be able to get with her. The girls go around and they, they flirt sometimes and things like that. And you got to pay them money for kisses and, and things like that. But re- but really, um, she's probably going to end up with the, with the other Cossack gentleman, you know. And I don't think that's really going anywhere for him. But he's almost content to just admire her beauty and to be in love from a distance for most of the novel, uh, novella. Right, um, okay. And then you know, some things happen. They just... One guy they, they kills an enemy, and then some enemies are going to come, and they talk to them and things. Not honestly, not a lot happens. It is more just showing you a bit of the Cossack lifestyle, and you know, and this one uh, guy. So not not a massive amount happens. I found it quite slow when I was just kind of skimming through it. Um, hmm. The other one is the death of Ivan Ilyich. 
Ah, this is a, this is a chap is. who, I mean, initially we hear that he's dying and most of his friends and most people who know him are immediately thinking, how does this benefit me? Like if he dies, then will I get the promotion that he has or, you know, this kind of, this kind of stuff. Um, and this is just the story of him dying in his final, his final time on earth. Mm. And his family aren't even that bothered. He's a bit of a hindrance to his wife. He can't get out of bed. He's, you know, he's getting all frail and he's, He's losing his looks. Um, he's becoming ugly. And, and, and isn't, is, but isn't he though like a lawyer who kind of worked too much and kind of live his life? It's he really kind of overworked and focused too much on on work. And mm-hmm. uh, he's you know, he's quite high up in in, in in like government postings even I think. But mm-hmm. it's more just like his daughter doesn't really care about him. Is in him and his wife don't like each other, so they're it just it's kind of sad to be honest. Mm. Um, but it's the shortest of the three, and it is just a glimpse into the, someone's last days, essentially. Um, and he has to reflect on whether or not he really spent his life well, or was his, you know, his mm. entire existence kind of tried and meaningless. Oh. Wow. But the one I liked, you know, and this will shock yeah. you, uh, DJ, it's called Happy yeah. Ever After. And this one is a romance. Ah, well, that, there you go. Surprise right there. So tell me about this. Happy ever after? Does it? That is it. A happy ever after? No. Well, I suppose it can't go. <laughs> you can't it is it. not. So yeah, what I thought. That's that's told, told story humor, right? Yeah. Okay. So we've got this nice uh, Russian family, and they've got a friend who comes to visit, and um, the mother says, in a passing comment, the mother says something like, "This guy is the kind of to her daughter. You know, this is the kind of guy that you should marry one day." And for some reason, just that sticks with the daughter. And she decides, I have to marry this friend of dad's. And this guy is like in his mid-30s and she's 17. Like he is more than double her oh, age. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Okay. And dad dies. And then she's like, you know, I didn't even like this friend of his. He's kind of old and melancholy. And, you know, I'm just going to marry him anyway because that's what I'm supposed to do. So they, they hang out a little bit. And he comes in and he takes on a fatherly role. And he instructs her on her piano playing and says, you know, oh, that bit wasn't good enough, but that bit was fine. And she can't believe that he cares enough about her to even tell her that she's not good enough. You know, this kind of, this kind of <laughs> thing. You know? Yeah, yeah this, sounds like a, <laughs> this sounds like the story again you mentioned where, where the, uh, the Le Femme, uh, I think, novel, right? Where she's basically putting her head on her dad's lap. Yeah. And, just, and that, that he's there. <laughs> Oh, it's, 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 more, it's more of that, you know. But it's ridiculous. Honestly, the guy turns out to be a good guy. Okay. And the girl is actually the character I don't like. Oh, okay. So she starts out full of romantic notions. You know, initially, the book's trying to tell you, forget about the person you grew up kind of fantasizing about, you know, your ideal person. Go oh. with someone different, this melancholy oh. guy. Uh, and she wants to okay. marry him and he likes her, but he won't display any affection. And he can be cold to her. Um, and then when it comes to a head and they talk about it and she asks him, look, what's actually happening here? And he makes up this thin, thinly veiled story. He's like, well, what if a particular gentleman, let's call him B, likes a particular girl, let's call her A, who's a family friend and much younger than him. It just describes their exact circumstances. in his very, very right, thinly okay. veiled uh, pseudonyms. And eventually he's like, you know, so what's going to happen? Either she's just making fun of me because I'm way too old for her. Or we get together and it's terrible. And then she says, well, there's a third ending. What if it's all good? And so they, mm. he says, well, I'm leaving you forever. Goodbye. And she says, no, don't leave me forever. What if we're in love? And he's like, okay, let's get married in like two days. Done. That's, that's the persuasion. It's all done. But what? He, he does, before that, he does try to say to her, I don't think it will work. I'm too old. I mean, he's, he's like 36. He's like, I want, yeah. uh, you know, a slow lifestyle. I want to sit by the fire. You know, you want to go to Petersburg. You want to have a, a big <laughs> um, society girl type lifestyle. And she says, no, no, I'm content to go to your farm. It'll all be, it'll all be good. It'll all be good. And of course, he was right all along. So they go there. Mm. And after a c- couple of months of insane, passionate love. Um, oh, wow. Well, at least they had that, for God's yeah. sake. I mean, isn't that something? Spent under the roof of uh, the mother-in-law. His his mother, who's this really strict lady, and you know, they're just kind of tiptoeing around her, but then they enjoy their mornings and their evenings together. You know, um, is it quite graphic? Is it is it quite graphic? I suppose no, it's for, not uh, really graphic, but it's it's just funny because the um, the mother in law is very so he she's called Katji and he's called Sergey. By the way, I should give their names. The mother in law is okay, very yeah. strict and she's just you know, very old school, you know. But they just kind of tiptoe around her and they 
they have their nice mornings and their nice evenings together and everything like that. Um, mm. Then what happens is she gets bored. She's a terrible person. So she starts saying, well, I'm bored. What if I just cause drama? What if I just cause my husband, like, emotional drama and turmoil in order to amuse myself? You know, mm-hmm. what if I'm just causing problems and, you know, just... Uh, she's just a terrible, terrible girl. So then he eventually says, okay, you need to go to the capital. You need to go into society. That will liven things up. The farm is too boring for you, but I did warn you about that. And... Mm-hmm. So they go into society, and of course, she's going to parties and balls. They She's flirting with other men. A guy even kisses her at one point, and they drift further and further apart. Uh, and he okay. puts up with a lifestyle he doesn't like in the city until eventually it all comes to a head, and he says, you know, I'm going back to the farm. They're, they're so far apart, they don't even speak most days anymore, you know, after the months of which, intense passion which, that they had. Which, which reminds me of, uh, you know... As I said, it reminds me of Anna Karenina in the sense of the farm yeah. passages there for peace, yeah. But but they forgot. This is only 100 pages. They forgot to put in the uh, the 500-page farming manual. Oh, no. Okay, that's a pity. So he didn't develop the, his own method quite yet. His no. own Anna Karenina method. There's an earlier book, isn't it, the Anna Karenina? Is this a, yeah, an I, early I, think, I think so. Okay. So essentially, it's just this bit of a story about their life, you know, and, and things are going wrong. And it's it's about changes in love. It's about the initial mm. connection they had. Then it's about the, the intense passion that they have. Uh, and they have a child as well. And she, she doesn't oh. even like the child. She's like, I don't like this, this infant that's in my house now. Like, I just want to go to parties and, uh, you know, go around in pretty clothes and things like that. Uh, well, and she, he, didn't, she, didn't, he, she didn't live her youth, didn't she? That's her problem. Exactly. She didn't he herself, regains so. a second happiness by giving all the love he had for her to the child now. Okay. And, you know, essentially what happens is she figures out that she messed everything up and she says, and then it gets a bit sexist and she says, why didn't you use the power that you have over me? Why didn't you forbid me to go to society? Why didn't you beat Mm -hmm. me? Why didn't you kill me? And because I ruined everything and I wanted to go back to the way it was. And he says, you had to find that out for yourself. I could never have controlled you. You had to learn from your mistakes but it can never go back to the way it was. It's done. It's broken. And now we have a different kind of love where we just kind of live mm. in the same place and tolerate each other, but the passion will never come back. And the, con- mm. you know, the conclusion, the, the, the girl is the one who's actually writing the book. And the conclusion yeah. is, and we lived happily ever after, but well, we never ever regained our former mm. passion. We just kind of existed together in the same dwelling. And mm. at 25 years old, at, by the end of the book, she just resigns herself to this life oh, of nice. nothingness. 25? Okay, that's what you're mentioning at the beginning. I don't know. I, I, I just find, what's, what's going on? You know, like, I'm just thinking, can, can, can we not just be happy? With have, can the man not just be happy with having found love at the first place? And can the woman also not decide, like, okay, we had this, but if, may, if I'm not that happy with them, I won't stay with them. Just, I don't know. Well, dude. I'm not sure if that sounds like... In uh, the 19th century, that was unthinkable. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose so at different times. But still, It'd go like, around um, creating problems for yourself and, and moral lessons, you know? Uh, what I find interesting is that he was a really popular writer at the time. So people were reading this. Obviously, it was so what I find interesting about classics, at least, even though they seem often outdated, or at least the best classics don't, but some classics seem outdated. But at the time, it reflects the society at the time. So you can learn something about the society at the time. It must have been a big thing. It must have been a very repressed, unhappy society, Russia at the time. That's yeah. all I'm getting at, really. Yeah. But what's interesting is... Or, or Victorian you read, England. You read well, books from this time period. It doesn't matter if they're set in Russia, in England, in France, in all, Spain. They're all yeah. very similar. Yeah, I mean, you're not, have, you're not like a happy kind of 19th century book. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're about to cover one in America, again, similar. Oh, yeah. So, okay. But do well, you want to take your turn? Yes, uh, to talk about um, something um, set in the, in the 20th century, even though it's quite at the end, 20th century. I mentioned the teacher turns author uh, from Germany. Now I'm going to mention another teacher turned author. I'm talking about the unique Michael Moore Purgo, who is better known as the author of War Horse, which was turned into a Spielberg, um, Spielberg film. Mm-hmm. 
but I haven't read that book. Love to try it out one day. Um, I've never read. I it read. I've heard of it. No, I've heard of it. Yeah, I've heard it. That's supposed to be great. But to be honest, it was more. I think it was the cover and the plot, which is not something I usually go for necessarily. I often go. Hmm. I don't know. I often go for the author or like maybe what I heard about the author. But I found this cover very intriguing. It's an interesting uh, cover. I see it there. It's yeah. Based, it's a it's a slightly abstract, but it's a ship here, and there is a dog and a boy at either side just falling off the ship, and yeah, and it's it's a bit based on hokusai and Japanese paintings because it's called Kenske's Kingdom, and it's a book that's about a boy called Michael, just like the author, whose parents in England lose all their money, and instead of like trying for the next job. They, the dad decides, well, look, we all enjoy sailing. I bought this boat called Peggy Sue. Let's um, travel the world. Why not? It's a good world. idea. And that's just the way it begins. And so they travel the world. They, why not? It's got a map here as well where they went. They traveled from England uh, down to the Athoras and to lovely Canary Islands, Cape Verde Islands. And then ah, Africa. they get down to your neck of the woods. Oh, they get down there and then they move on Brazil and they see a lot of different places. And at the beginning, it's all just kind of like a journal. And he's having a nice time. However, you do know from the beginning, the very opening line is chapter one, Pegasus. I disappeared on the night before my 12th birthday, July the 28th, 1988. Only now can I at last tell the whole extraordinary story, the true story. Kenske made me promise that I would say nothing, nothing at all. And so at least 10 years had passed. So we already know that he's going to disappear. Sorry, did you say the character is called Peggy Sue? Uh, the boat is called Peggy Sue. Oh, the boat. So the boat is named after the Buddy Holly song? Uh, I think so, yes. Okay, that's Perhaps interesting. So. If you knew well, Peggy Sue, then you'd know why I feel blue without Peggy, oh, my yes. Peggy Sue. Oh, okay. So that's what it's called after. And well, anyway, the boy, they travel around the world. And all goes well. I mean, it's a bit difficult sailing. They, he and his parents, they study it and they manage. And then after a couple of storms, when you're getting close to after Australia, there's somewhere between Australia and Japan. It's very vague where they are, actually. There's somewhere in the Pacific. And it's not even a storm, but it's just that during the night, the, his dog, uh, Michael's dog, goes out and... She doesn't have her uh, harness on. She doesn't have like her safety vest on. And Michael's just worried. And he goes to look for her, grabs her because she didn't stop barking for some reason. And then they both just slip off into the into the sea at night. And okay. the boat drifts off. And so everything goes so fast that his screams can't even be here because his parents are sleeping at the bottom of the boat. And he's drowning. But then someone saves him and he wakes up on an island I mean, it's a bit here at the back kind of a picture uh, on an island shaped like a peanut and he yeah and he's just wondering how he got there he's with his dog but his parents are not there and it turns out a man a former japanese doctor from the second world war saved him and is now even providing food for him it won't talk to him and this guy is called Kenska. And there is a connection between the Second World War from the Japanese side and him being on this island ever since. He's in the 70s already, uh, living with orangutans. And okay. yeah, it's basically just this friendship that forms between them. I suppose Robinson Crusoe and Friday-esque. Um, mm. figure, especially because Kenska only speaks really broken English, uh, which I actually love. I find that the most poetical part of the book whenever he's really? broken English. Yeah, I love that because it's the, the broken English inside he he does express himself very well, very well. But I find all right. But it's kind of my interest at the moment of becoming minimalist. He's he's expressing himself using only like thirty words or whatever. Okay, fair enough. Um, have you ever read Robinson Robinson Crusoe? By the way, you know I have. I loved it. You have I, I never read it? Did not did not like the last chapter. I thought, why did he write that? It's a right. bit yeah. Uh, there's some. There's a chapter. I don't think most people know the real end from Robinson Crusoe. They think it just kind of yeah. 
Anyway, right, but right, the right. novel itself before that is really good. I really recommend it. It's I didn't quite... like Gulliver's Travels, and that put me off that kind of. No, stuff. no, but Robinson Crusoe is kind of very metaphysical, I find as well, and not really a typical kind of story of that era. I th I think. Um, okay. And in a sense, it this is the same here. Uh, Friday and Robinson Crusoe relationship, but uh, deeper, I suppose, and. It's, it's also, we don't know much about Kensker because he doesn't speak much in general, even in Japanese. He's, uh, he's, in, he's in words. He hasn't spoken really since the Second World War, I imagine. And this is set in the 80, 1980s. So I won't say more than that. It's a very short novel, again, uh, written for teenagers, essentially. Um, I have to say, the last chapter or two really almost had me in tears. And um, Oh, no. Especially the maybe the penultimate chapter called "The Night of the Turtles," where turtles are born on the island and they do things to protect the turtles. It's really and Michael uh, Michael Morpurgo is more of like a kind of a Green Party. He's a UK writer, but he's very much in the Green Party oh, right, right. kind of orientated. And good, he's the good. one I mentioned at the beginning of the episode who, in this book, he says uh, he uses sustainable paper from forests that are well managed and controlled and it, there's a tiny essay at the end there's even a tiny environmental essay at the end that's how dedicated it is and i have to say the whole story itself is quite environmental kenske really his kingdom is this island he basically protects the animals on his island because there are also kind of you know unconscious fishermen trying to kill the animals as well there's a bit of a dangerous side as well not just living mm -hmm. in paradise but this is um, these are good messages for the kids, you know. Oh, right! Like that's what I'm saying. So reading both these bo books, Kleine Gespenst, which is really just um, for me, it's like like this light living kind of feeling with this environmental message. It's the kind of books I am enjoying reading at the moment because it is the kind of books that I'm interested in writing. I would say the book I just wrote was very environmental, and I can only learn from people like Mark Burgo. And he said himself, I was listening to an interview, he said himself that he was just reading out to the kids and they got mm -hmm. bored with the stories that he was reading out. So he started telling, he started inventing his own stories and they were okay. they were more interested. And he explained it wasn't because his stories wasn't weren't, mm -hmm. they were better. They just said he meant every word he, he said. And that really inspired me. And also the environmental message of this book and... Yeah, I just think it's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's lovely. Oh, and he starts and he gets into painting as well, Dean, which you enjoy. Good. So they asked about that. Uh, so I highly recommend it. Kenska's Kingdom by uh, Mark Burgo. Um, lovely, lovely edition, by the way. Really like this. Really lovely and colorful. It's also got lovely illustrations. I just showed you one, didn't I? I'll show you another one. An inside illustration, like here, for example, you got like. Nice. Yeah, you got the two. You got the two individuals just like bonding here as well. It's a very different uh, illustration style to the previous book, but still, still yeah. Uh, and you know what I love about this? I do love writing about Second World War as well, and kind of like because there's so because I grew up with on the German side. On my German side, really, my grandparents were my granddad's. Well, not many people knows, but he had to fight for the Nazis aged 18 and he hated it he shot himself in the leg to get away from it and be captured by uk um soldiers he hated it and my grandmother she was only a teenager in the second World war and you know terrible things happened to her classmates and she just managed to flee and it's just like these terrible visual stories and also poignant and i love then when someone i love when someone takes a modern story that is somehow linked to the Second World War. And you know, I've showed you my writing, Dean, with the Okutama mm -hmm. Express. The Okutama Express, it has that. It still, has got that my, still got my draft copy sitting on the shelf. Well, there. Yeah, well, I'm glad you have it. And it's got the Second World story, especially in the Japanese side. I mean, the Japanese, German stories, they're insane stuff. So I really enjoyed his background story, which obviously, it, you're, you know it's going to happen. And so it's not really a, a spoiler, but you're looking mm. forward to it. So at the end, he does learn more english and he opens up and he does tell why he is actually there so i was always looking forward to that part and then i really did enjoy it when it came good so if you want to know you know and it's not it's not very what i want to say it's not very kind of like teachy preachy it's mm. just 
a story and you are learning a bit about the history, in this case of Japan, and also about the environment, but just perfect for kids. It's not like a lecture. It's just, oh yeah, through an interesting story. So, so you see the teacher really in both sides a bit here. So there are two similar authors in some sense, uh, teachers who are educating their children kind of like, or maybe like, no, not in your face, just kind of how can I teach without them even realizing, you know, mm -hmm. that as a teacher find interesting too. Yes. So you so check it out. Books. And I should say, oh, and it's, it's interesting. Go ahead. No, I just want to mention, I think it's being turned into a film this year or next year. Kansas Kingdom, I think uh, it was Killian Murphy as well. So oh, it's probably going to be another big film. Maybe you want to read it now before it even comes out. So Kansas Kingdom, uh, more Purgo. But sorry, you were saying that? No, I was just going to say it sounds like you had two good books. And, you know, interesting that yeah, I enjoyed don't... all the books I read this month. So we had a. Well, that's good. They weren't necessarily my overall favorites, but I think overall we've had a pretty, pretty decent collection this month. So very good. Nice. Nice. And I, I mentioned to you before the show, I'm starting. I'm starting next month with a 900-page oh, yeah. book in Spanish oh, about um, about ancient Greece, and it's called the the death of well, the assassination, technically the death of um, Plato. But you know he wasn't assassinated. So what I really love to do um, is read a 900-page book in a foreign language about an event that never happened. That's fantastic for me. You know? And um, <laughs> and it's it says a sequel of the assassination of Socrates, right, from the same yes, author, which makes more sense, and which I well, yes. I think I've recommended that one before. Indeed, but Plato, I'm not sure, you know, what's going on there. The next, next will be like the assassination of Immanuel Kant, and then series <laughs> uh, 34, the assassination of, of you know, Martin Heidegger. How, where does it stop? Like soaring <laughs> character guards. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, have fun. Uh, but now tell me this thing: your 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 patience is unbelievable. Are you going to continue reading it if you don't like it after page two? Because you have read books. That you didn't like, I after probably page two. will. Okay. And I, I liked the oh, first nice. one, so I guess I liked the second one. The style was good and engaging, and I liked the subject matter. So, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. fair enough. I, I picked fair this enough. one up. I believe I picked it up when I was in uh, when I did my Gibraltar visit, and then I also visited um, oh, yeah. Malaga and Marbella and things somewhere along that trip. I, I think I picked this one up. So nice, nice. <laughs> Welcome back to part two with the Dean and EJ, the Books Boys. Woo! Whoa, baby! So, PJ, I've only got two more books and to review. And if I'm being honest, um, I'm really only going to talk a lot about one of them. Um, oh. The Scarlet Letter, I'll do it first to get out of the way didn't inspire a lot of conversation, which might surprise you. But I thought uh, Alex recommended this to your mutual friend, right? Yeah, he, he did. Just because it's, you know, it's 1850, um, it was when it's written. It's taking place it, in sort of it, Boston, New England, this um, type of um, American, early American sort of society, very Puritan um, community, super religious, super hmm. strict. Um, and he said to me, like, you know, the way he sold it to me was that's during the time of like the Salem witch trials and all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't yeah. really come up very much. And um, was he is he a fan of the book? I'm not sure if he recommended it because of its cultural significance or because he liked it. Like, I'm actually not even so sure if he's read it. I need to talk to him about it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, fantastic. So tell um, me. But I've had it lying around on the shelf for a long time, so I just decided, I'll, well, I'll, you know, I mean, I'll get to it. It's it's, a, it's an American classic for the first yeah, time. Yeah, it's a classic. Um, so let's get into Amer American literature. So yeah. what did you think of it then? It was it was grand. <laughs> it was like one of the most <laughs> important books in American no. literature. No, it was fine. Like, it's very short. You, I, it's only 200 pages. I read it in two days. So that was very disappointing. So you would have liked it more if it had done Anna Karenna method. Maybe, maybe. It's written in, you know... There's a lot of thou arts and a lot of sort of old Middle English type. Uh, I, thought you, you know. I thought you would like that stuff. Uh, yeah, it's fine. I just... <laughs> okay. So in terms of the... Does the witch type stuff come in? Well, there's one... There's a yeah. character that referred to as an old witch lady and she's talking mm. about a some kind of thing in the guy in the forest and whatever. 
but that's just mentioned a couple of times. Like it never comes to anything. We never find out anything about there's witches a, or there's a know, point. There's a point. Yeah, yeah. It's like you're you're just the idea that that stuff might be going on in the background, but that's it. It's not really relevant, you know. Mm. So I'm going to do this one in three minutes if I can. It can be really dealt with very very in a very straightforward manner. We have a girl. Oh, she's come over from England. Her husband's supposed to be coming behind her. Two years later, he hasn't shown up. Oh, Lord. She sleeps with another person, uh, oh. a preacher. And oh, Lord. Oh, mercy. even though her husband oh. is not there for two years and possibly dead, like there's been no word from him. He could have been shipwrecked on the way over, whatever it is. This, this super strict, you know, Christian Puritan uh, society yeah, yeah. brand her, you know, as a kind of harlot. Um, mm. And so she takes all this moral culpability and shame. She refuses to ever say who the guy was. Okay. So the preacher mm. has guilt on his hands, but he's safe. Whereas she has to stand in the pillory and be kind of abused by the town for a couple of hours. And then for the rest mm. of her life, wear this scarlet letter A embroidered with gold thread onto her, her dress. All right. She has to go around with this mark of shame for the rest of her life. Um, Interesting. I, 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 I had no idea that's what the scar letter. Yeah, no, did I. I thought it was a letter someone written. Yeah, I thought it was a letter. Yeah. So it's, okay. a, it's a letter embroidered on her, and she has a little baby. Um, oh, what, what do you mean? People... Hold on a second. From like from from the from the preacher, or yeah, just from her from oh, the preacher. Right, yeah. And people joke about the baby that she's called Hester. Um, they joke about the baby that it's a kind of half demon or a half witch but i don't think anyone really takes it seriously like they say that almost in half jest the town actually want to look after the baby you know they're not trying to kill it or anything yeah. strange with that to be honest it sounds really good though you right it does it does it's, sound it's good it's just, right so that's the premise but that all takes place quite quickly and then nothing really happens for the rest of the book that's the problem right um, yeah. the premise is fantastic um but but, but basically she, she's shunned by society and she slowly wins them over over like a seven year period by just like being humble putting up with any humiliation and abuse the time give her you know and eventually kind of wins them over i i guess her little daughter pearl um you know the, the joke that she's a kind of witch child or a fairy or something because or half elf mm-hmm. because she's very high spirited and runs around and she's a child right that's what children do mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. The town want to take the child off her at one point because they want to make sure the child is well raised, not by an immoral woman. Um, but mm. she resists and they accept it. And, and to be honest, it's all fine. Um, there is this idea that, you know, the priest is the, the, the preacher, or the pastor, or whatever he is, is a bit of a coward. You know, he's letting her take all the shame and he's not taking any. And he kind of says, one one day I'll be able to hold your hand in public. Um, but for now, let's sneak away to the forest and, and do it, you know. And what so they're still making still making love? Not well, no, but they're just like meeting up and, and displaying affection for each other. Not initially, but it grows back again throughout the course of the book. Okay, okay. And um, but there is a villain, old Roger Chillingworth. There's this old re- you really mean old evil man going around the town. And it mm. turns out, slight spoiler, he's the husband. Oh, wait, no, 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 hold on a sec. This is important. Because the okay, book needs a villain. He's the husband who was meant to have followed her over in the beginning. Oh. But he's been okay. there all along. And for some reason, he doesn't. He just disregards her and doesn't want anyone to know that he's her husband. So the, the main premise of this novel is if you reveal my secret that I'm your husband, then I'll reveal the secret that it was the preacher who is the father of your baby. Right. So that's, the, that's where the tension of the entire novel comes from. Okay, okay. So they go on for Honestly, seven years in this limbo of her just putting up to, with like humiliation daily. Honestly, it sounds awesome. But yeah, okay, you, you still didn't like it. I mean, the premise does sound great. I will say I did like it. I just feel like maybe more needed to happen or just kind of, there was times where I was skimming through it because there was entire chapters where nothing was really happening and they're just kind of preaching at me, you know? Okay. But, you know, the most the most salient point to take away from this book and you get this in a lot of the Victorian literature as well. It's these kind of Christian lady societies. You get them in the, in the Dickens books and things. But mm-hmm. it's this idea of like, and I find the Puritans essentially evil in this book, but they're using religion to mask their own moral culpability. You know, like they're, mm-hmm. they're treating this poor girl who, as far as I can see, has really done nothing wrong. And they're treating her horribly 
under the guise of, well, we're like super strict religious, you know? And I, I think that really the social commentary is on religion, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. But I was disappointed that there was no, not really much witch stuff. But yeah, like the, the Puritans want to have this holier than thou kind of self righteousness. And all they're really doing is using it as, as, a, as a cloak to go around and, and be mean to other people. So yeah, that's really all I have to say about The Scarlet Letter. I don't want to spoil the ending, and it's a short book, so there's not a huge amount to, to, to go through. The premise is fantastic, and the book is yeah. decent. Um, you know, maybe if a bit more had happened in the second half, that's all. I've got to say, though, Dean, that this month's uh, the premise from all the books so far really found very intriguing. So, yeah, actually, you did a good job. I mean... I mean, yeah, it's not that, I, I, obviously, I just have problems with all this Victorian philosophy at the time, but the story themselves, very intriguing, especially the last one. Like, uh, you know, I, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. And we've only yeah. got one uh, one more book to go, and then we're going to be out of here. Oh, oh hold on. What's this? See? The phone ringing, I think. Uh, bear with me, Justin. Go back in a few minutes. I'll see who's going. Okay. Hello, you're through the books, boys. You've got Dean on the line. Who's calling? Uh, it's John Constable. John, wow. Well, it's nice of you to call in. Uh, and I'm assuming that you're the John Constable who wrote this lovely book that I have in front of me, The Chanteuse from Cape Town. The Chanteuse from Cape Town. Yes, indeed. Um, it's my debut novel. And uh, it was released uh, into the world about two months ago now, uh, mid-January. Yeah, so I, I got this one more or less, you know, as, as soon as it was out and we, we talked about it last month. Um, so it's very fortuitous of you to, to call in and have a chat with us about it. Um, I mean, first off, I, I loved it. Uh, and if you heard that our episode, you'll you'll know that I really, really had a, a high opinion of it. Um, you've been writing for a long time. Is that right? Uh, yes, but on and off. Um, I uh, have been at this for many decades but there have been long gaps in between my writing stints because I was doing other other things but it's something that uh, I've come back to in recent years and uh, I'm trying to make more of an effort now to craft something which um, uh, constitutes a series and this uh, this expedition with uh, Sol Nemo and South Africa um, is um, the way I'm planning to go mm -hmm. certainly for the uh, for the forthcoming period there is a second book which is um, completed and I'm working on a third at the moment um, so yeah I I'm trying to put some impetus behind it wow okay so that's you know something I usually ask at some point is when's the next yeah. book going to be written but you've done it you've written it <laughs> uh, yes and I'm hoping to launch I think perhaps late summer maybe September October time uh, there is obviously some work uh, to be done in terms of publishing and book cover design and all that sort of stuff. Those bits and pieces, but that's, yeah. That, but that's the plan at the moment, yeah. Okay, and you've already got ideas for a third, which is fantastic. Now, at the moment, we've got the one book, and then there's a short story that you can read on your website. Isn't that right? Uh, uh, yes, yes, that's right. That's right. I don't know whether you've looked at the short story. Not many people seem to actually find it, but... Um, yeah, that, that that's there, and it's about five thousand words. So it's a uh, you know it's a fifteen twenty three. Mm -hmm. No, that's it's interesting to get that little extra little bit just to give us a little bit more of of Saul. I, I like yeah. Saul. He's your kind of. I mean, how, how would we describe the guy? Because he's he's got his links with Saps, the kind of police force there, yeah. but he also isn't trusting of them, and he's a bit of a, a renegade. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. And obviously, on the back of this massive inheritance, which he received and wasn't uh, certainly in any way expected, he does have a certain freedom of manoeuvre, which might be denied to uh, other people whose circumstances are more straight and yeah, he gets around okay. He's got his nice car and everything, which eventually gets blown up. But yeah, you know, yeah. he has but a nice heart as well, though. I and I mentioned it last last month. But there's the moment where you know when he's when he's going around talking to people and trying to find out information, and he comes across the the one girl who's been really mistreated by her husband. But you know, he's rich and yeah. she can't afford the lawyer, so he says, "Well, here's my yeah. overpriced kind of watch. Go and pawn it, yeah. and uh, you know, get yourself a lawyer." Yeah. So he has a heart. Yeah. 
Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Um, I mean, that's all part, I think, of trying to create a, a character. Um, so I, I try to be conscious of these things, uh, you know, just introduce some subtlety and some nuances, hopefully, which, um, you know, will strike a resonance and get people to um, like the character and hopefully like uh, the writing uh, and, and, and the plots which I'm trying to create. Mm -hmm. The plot's brilliant. I mean, I love that we, we deal with the character first, you know, and obviously there's stuff happening. We've got the uh, stuff with Frank and Mira and everything. But then we, we you know, by the end, it's a, it's a full on, uh, you know, action movie type type scene when they get up to Swartman's um, vineyard and everything. So it, oh, it, it, yes. it gets very yeah. dramatic. <laughs> that, that, that's been commented upon by uh, other people. I, but certainly at the time that I was writing it, I, I wasn't particularly conscious in that sort of in, in that sort of way. But yeah, I mean, there is quite a quite an explosion, I, I think, towards the end of the book. There is, although I think it's apt. You know, it builds up to it. It doesn't come out of nowhere. Yeah. It, it fits and everything. It's it's, it's perfect. Um, yeah. Let me ask you, who do you see as being the real villain of the book? Is it Dutois or is it Swartman? Well, I, I think both of them. Um, as one of my reviewers uh, said, um, Detroit is unlovely. Um, and uh, Sportman, well, I mean, he's a, a drug dealer of long standing. So, you know, they, they, they form a conspiracy between the two of them. And, um, yeah, they're, they're both pretty unappealing characters. Yeah, I mean, I guess Swartman's more your, as you say, kind of career criminal type, um, more into the violence. I mean, they rough up Saul pretty bad. Um, sure. Whereas Dutrois, I suppose, is more your, the fancier type of criminal. You know, he's got his official kind of business. He's he's doing yeah. his financial advising to Frank and, you know, whatever he's doing for him. And he's kind of making everything seem a nice, nice little sheer uh, veneer of, of, of officialness to it all. But then under the surface, he's actually just working with, Sportman, yeah. yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. It's very much a criminal um, enterprise, but obviously they approach it from different uh, motivational uh, standpoints. Mm. Yeah. I, I want to ask you one question. Was there a deliberate decision not to give us too much of Frank? Because, you know, reading the early parts, I'm thinking, okay, Saul's so got this big, you know, bond to Frank. Um, hopefully we'll we'll get to know a lot about this guy and then we don't really see much of him and then he's dead <laughs> yeah 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 um I, I think this was just the way that the thing evolved as I was writing it and you know one of the aspects which um I, I think I was keen to explore as far as Sol's character was concerned is, is this personal battle that he's mm. got with mental health um, and obviously that comes into very sharp focus at the point where, um, you know, sadly, he loses this um, surrogate father figure. Yeah, and Frank, and that's something important to mention, Frank was a kind of father figure to him. And yeah. I suppose yeah. he was the, he was important yeah. in his life. So that's what, I mean, that's the whole reason that, that so, that's Saul's entire motivation here, isn't it? It's to protect you know, Frank, obviously, he thinks he's been swindled out of this money. Yeah. He's a bit suspicious of Mira as well. And he's doing it, you know, there's nothing tying him to this. He hasn't been paid to do this investigative work as such. No, that's right. That's right. But uh, his uh, his motivation, I think, going forward, because he has the benefit of this very large inheritance, um, is that he's in the position to be able to you know perhaps give something back and to work for people typically who wouldn't be able to afford his services so again that is part of the part of the character I mean he works for free um, he, he's not there running a business in, in the way that he would have to if yeah. um, he didn't have um, other means uh, independent means which I suppose is, is admirable and as I say he's, he's a likable despite being a a bit of a tough guy almost and a bit of a renegade he's also as we yeah. said before he is he's likable so that that just plays further into into that um, no, no, yeah yeah you know, I, I mean certainly a central character of that sort i think has to be likable um yeah I'm, I'm, it's debatable well, i suppose maybe he wouldn't be but i mean i would rather read books that um where you relate to the character in some positive sense rather than thinking well actually 
you know, this person is a really bad lot, and I'm going to have to plough through the rest of uh, the rest of the book. So th- th- that was my that was my take on it. But I mean, like us all, you know, he's th- th- there are parts which are good, and there are parts which are bad, um, and there are bits in between where we might have some, you know, long discussion. Um, yeah, yeah. So. I want to ask a little bit about the the sequel then. I mean, I'm I'm not asking for any spoilers as such, but are we going to see more of Aisha? Uh, no, we're not actually. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, she's uh, she's a bit of a figure of mystery, isn't she? Um, she is, uh, I want more of her. <laughs> the, 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 the second the second book is called uh, The Truth about Anton van van Zaal. Um, it is profiled briefly on my website, which you can visit at uh, johnconstableauthor.com. And there's some information about me, but there is also a synopsis with regard to the uh, uh, to the second book. But no, sadly, she does not feature in the in the second book. Um, and as far as I can see at the moment, she doesn't feature in the third either so i mean maybe when maybe when i get round to to writing the fourth um perhaps she can be brought um she can be brought back in okay so maybe in the future but we're we're done with her for now yeah. she is interesting yeah. because i couldn't figure her out you know and i wanted i, I i'm a sucker for a romance plot right i want the, the yeah, nice relationship with so and aisha to work yeah. out but at the same time we don't know he doesn't even know much about her never mind us <laughs> Yeah, well, it's the fact that, you know, his base is Port Elizabeth in South Africa, and she seems to spend an awful lot of time away in Johannesburg and Pretoria. And she is apparently um, working for this French perfumery company. Um, And, yeah, he he doesn't know too much about her. So this is a very sort of off-on relationship. And, of course, on the back of the fact that he's inherited all this money, uh, and because of his insecurities, um, you know, he's sort of questioning why she would suddenly be starting to make some more positive play for him than uh, has been the case in the past. So, again, uh, it's it's left as an open question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the last character, I suppose, that I think merits some discussion is, of course, the chanteuse herself it's it's mira yeah, yeah yeah i think she's a fantastic character and you know tragedy ensues and, and all the rest of it but yeah. um what was the insp- so i understand the inspiration for this the whole setting is obviously your own visits you know in south africa and, and spending time there yourself what was the inspiration yeah. from for, for the chanteuse for for mira uh, well i i was looking obviously to derive a plot um, and as I think these things often happen or they do as far as I'm concerned it's a uh, it, it's a process of building and it doesn't go together necessarily very quickly certainly in my case and you put bits and pieces together hopefully you've got some idea of where you're starting from um, and you've got hopefully some idea as where as to where you might end up and then there's this big piece in the middle which is not really fixed and you sit down and start mm. writing and things go off in different different directions um and the plots evolved um that's i think the best way that i can describe it i mean i spent i think probably about 18 months off and on actually writing it and uh, yeah it's a process of of evolution uh, Writers work in different ways, as you know. I mean, some uh, start simply with a blank page and off they go, and others will sit down and map everything out to the last mm-hmm. piece. I think I'm probably the um, in the first category. But always what you're trying to do, I think, is to put together something which is credible, you know, that you've got a plot which actually does hang together and people aren't left thinking, oh, gosh, no, that's another coincidence, which... Um, you know, I didn't expect or anticipate. So that's part of the difficulty is just, you know, getting everything to uh, to align. So, yeah, it, um, it is a process. It's a process. I, I have sleepless nights thinking about aspects of plot and, you know, yeah. what I might be doing going forward. 
I mean, that's every writer has their has their process, as you as you say. What one thing I always find interesting was two two authors that I find very similar are P.G. Woodhouse and Agatha Christie because they both churn out those little one hundred and eighty <laughs> page little short books. You know, yeah, one with murders, very... one with jokes. You know. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting actually because it's a long time since I've read any P.G. Woodhouse. Um, but on this uh, trip, this last trip down to South Africa, I thought I would reacquaint myself. So um, I bought uh, I, I bought a volume of collected short stories, I think called Carry On Jeeves. Uh, and yes. These were, these were written, uh, well, they, they were written, a number of them, over 100 years ago. And I worked my way through through that. And um, yeah, that was uh, that was quite uh, that was quite amusing. Mm. That was quite amusing. What I find very interesting, just on the note of the process, is despite despite Agatha Christie and and P.G. Woodhouse turning out what are comparable books, uh, Agatha yeah. Christie would just write it with no real idea what she was doing, and just yeah. you know, let it write itself. Whereas Woodhouse would write about a thousand pages and then edit it down to to two hundred. You know, so right. it's okay. interesting that you can have such a wildly different process. For, for a similar yeah. result yeah yeah and of course the other interesting thing i mean i don't when you were aware of, uh, of this but uh, pg woodhouse and raymond chandler were both educated at um Dulwich college oh. um not in the not in the same years but again there are there's some similarities i think in terms of um in terms of style and approach um yeah, it, it, it's a fascinating subject, but yeah, at the end of the day, different writers work in work in different ways, and uh, yeah, that's it. Well, normally when I do these uh, interviews, people tell me, "Oh, the next book's not going to be out for a year, two years," and I'm thinking, "Oh, yeah. my goodness!" But you've actually said the second book is written, so I'm hoping it's out uh, sooner rather than later, and I'm I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, yeah. I'll put a link to your website in the in the show notes um, so that people can go in and have a look at it. Um, and obviously they can get the book. What I'd like to ask you is our final question that I ask to everyone. Um, mm. If there's any existing book that you wish you'd been the person to write, what would it be? Um, hmm. If I had to choose one, um, I think it would probably be John Buchan's The 39 Steps. Ah, good choice. Um, which is, an, is a novella. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. not a long book. I'm not quite sure how many words it is, but you can read it from uh, start to finish in, in a couple of hours. And it does creak a bit, um, I think, and some of the attitudes uh, struck and so on we would regard now as being... Um, xenophobic yeah. and rather dated um but it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful story i believe and it's something that uh, i quite frequently reread um yeah yeah and the descriptions some of the descriptions of the lowlands of scotland i think are are brilliant mm -hmm. so yeah if i had to choose one at the end of the day you know if you were putting me on the spot that would um, that would be it i think it's a good choice i've actually not read it but i've seen it performed uh, in oh. theater and the story is no, no, it's, fantastic you, you, you must do you must do because uh you can pick, I, I don't think it's it was published originally in 1915 i don't think it's ever actually been out of print you can pick up a copy very cheaply and you can read it um you know in a couple of hours but mm. uh, I, I, I think it's great. I, I really do. <laughs> I'll have to get get a hold of it next time I go yeah. to the bookshop. Well, John, thank you so much for calling in. Uh, thanks right. for your time. Thanks. We love the book. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Yeah, no, thank you very much for the opportunity. And just to uh, reiterate, the title of the book is The Chanteurs from Cape Town. Um, and yeah, I, I, I hope people buy it and read it and more importantly, enjoy it. So, that's it we we recommend it i'll put the full title the link to your website and everything in the show notes and there'll be some pictures of me reading it on uh, on our instagram so everyone will fantastic. see the lovely cover and the full title john uh, take care thank you thank you thanks, thanks very much bye-bye yeah. well there we go thank you to john constable for giving us a call we chatted about his book the chanteuse from cape town in a bit more detail yeah. on last month's episode and it's always nice to hear from authors guys if you ever want to call into the show you can definitely do that if you want to send us your books or you need a mailing address get in touch booksboys at hotmail.com and we would love Thanks to much, yeah. hear from anyone you can even send us little voicemails or recommendations whatever you want and we'll, we'll play those on the show we've done that before
Yeah, thanks very much, guys. And thanks very much, John, for uh, calling in and sending us our book. Now, what I like is that this uh, this episode is going to be about two hours long. Well, probably not an hour and a half. PJ's still doing his laundry. I'm still doing my laundry. <laughs> I'm just finishing up. I'm going to show the... If you, if you want to see more, you know, just money, money. You can see... This could be a great uh, sideshow, right? If you pay more, you can see us doing the show and me doing the laundry at the same time. Yeah. So nothing, nothing else happening. I'm not wearing any provocative laundry. Just, I'm just wearing, well, you just, my, well, not just kind of pajamas, to be honest today, and doing the laundry. It's quite an impressive part I've got here. I've got to tell you. Dean, I'm going to show you. So I'll show you. Are you ready? Let's have it. Okay, here it is. Look at that. That's an impressive part. Neat piles of laundry, all nicely Neat folded. piles of laundry on a, on a huge table. Uh, mm. So I think it, it's very relaxing. My God, I never would have thought so relaxing to just have a chat. Do a bit of laundry. Yeah, there we go. So now every time you need to do the laundry, we just uh, we just do some kind of improvised uh, episode about well, something. You know? <laughs> indeed. And any anytime you, dear listener, want to do the laundry, why don't you listen to a sensual episode of Books Boys? Mm. There we go. But before we get too sensual, I'll I'll move on real quick. <laughs> okay. um, and also, as I, I mentioned emailing us, but don't forget, we've got things like Instagram and everything as well uh, at Books Boys Podcast. Message. I haven't been posting much anymore. Just I think social media is not really a great thing in general. What about, the, just... what about the whole water bottle? Uh, not water bottle, you know, the whole bottle message we're talking about. Is that not in anymore? Like messages through Send the... Send us a message in a bottle. Uh, smoke signals, yeah. carrier pigeons. We love to get your, your books in those your methods. Novel. Your novel on that method, yeah. So, so the last uh, the last book was Carlos Ruiz Zafon. Oh uh, yeah, we're talking about the big guy. Noche. So the midnight we're talking palace. About the big guy. Nice picture of a train on fire. Oh, you can't see it. My camera's knocked off. No, there off, you go. Man. Nice picture of a train uh, on fire there on the. And that is the I, I read the first part of that trilogy, right? I'm not sure what the name of the trilogy is now, but it's a series of. Um, you read the Prince books. of Mist. I read The Prince of Miss Wire. What a great book. What mm. a great book I'm telling you. A uh, beautifully, concisely, what I was just saying, concisely written story set in the Second World War, but outside the Second World War. But it's kind mm. of like always in the background. So I have a surprise for you. It's actually, I don't believe, a trilogy. His main books oh. that we covered before are a series, but his young adult books yeah. that he wrote first, I thought they were also a series. It turns out they're just unrelated books. It's just they're often published together. I've noticed yeah. here in Spain. Because okay. this one is set in 1932, Calcutta, in India. Right. Nice. Okay. Uh, has a guy that, like, I love Stefan. So, guys, if you haven't read The Shadow, uh, uh, the Shadow of the Wind, La Sombra del Viento, and the whole kind of sequence of novels that came, we made a whole episode of a, one of our favorite, one of my favorite episodes, just about Stefan. And my guy, he's such a great author, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He is fantastic, he? and uh, we did talk about interviewing his ghost at one point, but we never got around to that. We, but we, we uh... did, yeah. <laughs> well, that comes to... because I literally thought at the time he was still alive, and yeah, yeah. he passed on. Yeah, <laughs> and then I also thought we might have the chance to talk with him, but it was probably not the case. Even yeah. if we have him, but... well, yeah, anyway. he's very famous. But... Um. So, how, what do you think of this book? So, I love the uh, Prince Prince and Yellow was his first book. And this is his second book. This is the second book we wrote. Second book. Um, it's only about three hundred pages. A lot, sh- you know, shorter than some of the ones we covered before. Um, mm. I was expecting something really simplistic compared to the other books because I thought these are the young yeah. adult ones. But there's really there's not much of a of a drop. You know, I thought this is going to be like almost for children or something com- compared to the Cemetery of Lost Books. It's it slightly good. more basic, but really not not a big drop mm. in in uh, in level of language or or anything like that. Hmm. So, what is the story? We have a chap called Jawahal, who is our villain. Um, mm-hmm. So we, we kind of meet him first. We find out that he's a villain, basically. And that's that's like the, the intro part of the novel. We don't like this guy. Then we mm-hmm. have a Mr. Carter, who's the head of this place that essentially we have children, um, I guess orphans, essentially, like grow, growing up in this place until they hit 16, Okay. And a lady comes to him in Aryani and she sort of says, she's inquiring about a particular boy that might be there. And then our villain, yeah. Jawahal, also goes to him to inquire about a boy who might be there. And this is a boy called Ben. Mm. 
And this boy is just finishing up his his time there. He's coming up to his his 16th uh, birthday. And he's a member of a group of friends called the Chobar Society, who are all, I think, about to finish up their time. And the society is disbanding. Okay. Okay. This lady has a girl with her called Sheer. Possibly Sheere, I'm not sure. But it turns out that that Sheere is um, actually Ben's twin sister. Hmm. And then we've got a bit of, um, you know, family stories going on. My one criticism of the book is a lot of the story is told by the granny just giving exposition. There's just like a, here's a massive exposition dump. I'm going to tell the entire story in like this long narrated chapter. And I, I really felt that that wasn't a good way to do it, you know? Right. And um, that's my only real criticism. But I want to still enjoy the book. I'm not going to let that take away from it. It's just maybe a strange way to do it. Um, it turns out hmm. this guy, Jawahal, I mean, the book gets a bit magical, right? Which sometimes loses me a little bit. But he somehow has engulfed the soul of their father. And hmm. now he needs to replenish it. And now that they're kind of coming of age, he wants to take um, ben and Ben and take his soul to keep his own spirit living, essentially. Hmm. It kidnaps all the friends and everything, so that's where it ends up. But I'm not going to go into the ending. Um, yeah. But they, they meet in this old abandoned house, which they call the Midnight Palace. And then it turns out that this is the house that their dad had built for them. And they there's some mm-hmm. clues that they follow, and they follow these clues, and then they, they get to um, like this old train station that has this train, and that j- j- the Jawahal is on, and, and then it's a fire and everything, and that's the cover that we just talked about. It's kind of a lot happening, but it gets a little bit weird when it starts to get mystical, uh, you know, mm. and it, with the spirits and things like that. It sort of loses me a little bit. I, I do prefer things that are really realistic based on reality or, you know, maybe a Dickens mm. style caricature of reality, but fantasy loses me a little bit. But I think this was well mm. done. And um, yeah, I mean, again, I don't have a, a massive amount to, to talk about there's good there's drama with the family with them discovering that they're twins and um, with you know the fact that Jawahal kind of has a spirit of his dad or whatever or the body of his dad then there's the you know explosions and fire and all this kind of drama there's the big set piece at the end where Ben has to choose whether his friends oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not going to sort of say what happens but I just want to no, no, no. that, that there is a big dramatic kind of piece um, well yeah it's a fun after all yeah. it's just no, no, unfortunate that there's a big exposition dump in it that kind of gives you the whole story in one go right you know? okay so it's like well what are well, we waiting for now i suppose he's still experimenting around as a novelist i mean uh the shadow of the wind is either his fourth or his fifth novel i'm not sure right now so i mean yeah it takes a while to get that kind of practice i suppose mm. and i made um, that sound fast but you know a lot of the novel is spent up with people trying to say this guy is coming after us trying to convince mr carter Please look through your records. You know, this guy Jawahal is coming after us. Well, can you help us? You know, and then they go to this um, hospital where he was, he was supposed to have been until it had burnt down. Or, and then they mm. say, well, actually, we can't find a record of this guy. Uh, and they say, well, sure, he would be dead anyway. And they say, what do you mean he would be dead? And they say, well, it, it burned down in like 1857. Uh, and they say, no, but he told us it burned down in 1916. And right, then that, okay. they can't find a record of that incident. So, things get a little bit more wishy-washy and a bit more mysterious. But I I sometimes feel like not everything is cleared up. Although you could argue that that's the case with Zafon anyway. You know, when we read um, the second book before, it gets a bit confusing near the end and and not not all the mystery is ever really cleared up other than they mentioned later that the guy was going a bit crazy. You know? Mm. So so maybe that is just a trope of his. But I, I just, I liked this. I just didn't... When I, read, when I read La Sombra del Viento, I needed more. When I read yeah, yeah. El Juego del Ángel, I needed more. When I read this, I kind of thought, okay, that was fine. Right. Okay. You know, I'm not about to rush out and buy The Prince of Mist now, or Marina, or, or whatever the other one is. You know, I just don't, yeah. I don't feel that this was as strong. But it's earlier work, and it's more basic work. So I, I suppose that's to be expected. Mm. Okay, okay. Okay, fair enough. But are you still going? Do you think you still might read more just because you still love the fat? You still love a you know what I mean? Or do you think you really don't want to give? I would say that if I'm in a bookshop and I see a copy of them at a decent price, I might pick one up, but I'm not going to rush out and get them, you know? The first Safon book I read was The Prince of Miss, Prince of the Niebla, and I bought it 
with with you. You were there in the magic bookshop in Belfast in Spanish. Do you remember? A bit of hard I part don't. Of they they very rarely yes. have Spanish books in there. That was a good a long time ago. Now I think that was uh, I think that was back in uh, 2014. Wow. So we were in Magic Bookshop and I've got it there. So that was my first Safan, Safan book. And I love Benicio and Niebla and I had a really lovely hard uh, back edition as well, where I, which I got in the Magic Bookshop. So I recommend that one. I don't know mm-hmm. what his other uh, young, young adult books are like. I but actually went to the, to the Magic Bookshop recently and I purchased an oh, Agatha that's... Christie and I thought, I'll read this and we'll do a Caper Captains. And of course, it turned out that I'd already got it uh, and I'd already read it. Oh, so I've not got a duplicate uh, copy. So. <laughs> well, anyway, you can never have enough of, of Agatha Christie. You can never tell if you've read them because they all sound the same based on just the blurbs. Well, it's, the great that we're, it's great that we're, you know, we're, we're, put, we're sponsoring this magic bookshop, yet it's not the name of the bookshop, is it? Uh, I, I actually don't remember the name of the bookshop <laughs> right now. It's Ke- in- Keats and Chapman, but I prefer to forget that. I prefer to call the magic bookshop. Okay, okay. But it is run by a magician. He speaks uh, usually Irish when I go inside. Oh, okay. I've never had that, but I have there. had them um, playing some trumpet for me while I've been there. Well, anyway, it's a, yeah, it's a lovely. Look, it's in Belfast City Centre, pretty central as well. So just do have a look out for that bookshop yeah. as well. What's it called again, then? Keith I mean, what's it, and know? Chapman. And you wrote a poem about it, and I, I did a painting about it, which we covered yeah. in an episode of Poetry Pals on our on our Patreon. And we made some promotional photos outside of it, just very spontaneously with our mutual friends. a lot friends, of that. I think even on uh, on books. Does he even know about us? Does, did, 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 I hope. I hope he's aware that we're promoting the, the, the book. I think I told him. Uh, I sent him the, the the painting, the poem. I think. Oh, did you? That's sweet. Okay. He just said, "Yeah, that's that's nice." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a magic trick. Play the trumpet. Yeah. Maybe he can, he can. Hey, he can maybe compose a trumpet song for us in Irish. I love, I love that. That would be cool. Yeah. Well, I I don't have anything more to say about the book really, other than that it was it was it was good. Um, you know, Zafon's always good. It was just early early work. I think yeah. that's us um, at an end. Um, dear PJ, oh. there we go, there we go. Um, so I really enjoyed doing the laundry again. I'd recommend that. I definitely want to read more some conscious children books. If anyone else out there wants to want to send us some, that's what I'm interested at the moment. Oh. But I wish you all a. Uh, I wish I wish you all a great reading uh, month and a great reading April when you're listening to this. But by this time, when you're listening, Dean will already have gone to Athens. But now, first of all, I just want to wish you a great trip, yeah. you and your mutual our mutual friend. Thank you that very much. Great. There will be more Enjoy trips the- this year. In fact, uh, when Enjoy you the listen hummus. to the end of May episode, you will hopefully hear about um, ah. my visit to Gran Canaria. So that'll be ah, there you go. an interesting uh, interesting trip. Hopefully we Exciting get some stuff. more promotional photos. <laughs> Exciting stuff ahead. <laughs> Guys, that's the end. Um, I was thinking about what to close this this episode with. And I thought, you know, why don't we do something slightly different? We once made, I don't know when, maybe in around 2015 or so, a little short instrumental on the keyboard together mostly you to be honest uh, it's called hmm. dancing in a cuban cafe and i thought we'd uh, we'd close with that let's do it so if the dj would spin that record we'll be back in about a month see ya
Books Boys was presented by The Dean and PJ Burke in association with Thaddeus Penguin Productions. Ah. This episode was brought to you by our sponsor, Pawning Diamonds for My Husband. If you would like to get in touch, you can email us at booksboys at hotmail.com or visit us at booksboys.com. The intro uses Driving in the 70s from the Of Soundtracks and Garage Bands EP by Trap Door. And the outro uses Dog's Light by Bravo Max from the album of the same name. All music used is either pod safe or used with permission. If you'd like to support the show, go to patreon.com slash booksboys, get the show early, and all of our bonus booth fan the boys shows. And you can also check out our music on Spotify or Apple Music. Thank you kindly for listening to us. Please tell your friends, and come back next time for another episode of Books Boys. Read some books! Okay, I need to edit that out. That is not what I meant to play. I was just saying that you just played that.